Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll get started on uh, session three. Good morning, my name is Cheryl Collier. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Windsor, and I'm very happy to be moderating this panel. Um, the panel that uh, uh, I get the pleasure of moderating has four speakers. So uh, because of this, we're going to be a little bit more draconian with the time uh, than uh, perhaps was allotted to the uh, former speakers because they, uh, they have a little bit more time uh, per speaker. Um, at the same time, I think we have lots of interesting things to discuss in this uh, session that uh, builds off of some of the uh, earlier panels this morning. Uh, nor, uh, uh, specifically, we'll be talking about other communities and what we can learn from other communities, as well as ideas. And I think the, uh, the ideas have been flowing, but not uh, specifically examples of, of other communities in the area. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to the speakers today. Um, we also will be talking about the dreaded taxes and uh, challenges associated with taxes in our communities. And uh, uh, I know that's a, a theme in our community here in Windsor, Essex, uh, that uh, perennially comes up. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. It's Dr. Enid Slack, who is from the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs. Uh, she's director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance, and uh, I will let her uh, introduce her talk. Thank you very, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, and thank you to the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the University of Windsor for inviting me here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about ways of increasing the tax base, but particularly focusing on property tax incentives. And because the university is uh, one of the sponsors today, I'm calling it Property Tax Incentives 101 uh, Pros and Cons. I think Matt Marchand suggested I call it Property Tax Incentives the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, but, but I stuck with this title. Just a couple of caveats before I begin. Uh, we talked this morning about a Canadian national auto policy. We talked about a Canadian national energy policy. I will not be talking about a Canadian national property tax policy. This is a local tax. So let's keep it local. Uh, the second thing I want to say before I begin is, even though I am the academic on the uh, on the panel, uh, with the exception of our moderator, I have no charts, and I only have six slides. I was expecting an applause. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to uh, explain what property tax incentives are. Uh, the obvious question, do they actually work? Lots of, lots of places have them, particularly in the U.S., uh, some in Canada. Do they actually work? What are the arguments for them? What are the arguments against them? So, a lot of communities try to attract businesses locally, uh, and they do that by giving them a temporary reduction in property taxes. In Ontario, and, and, and in Canada, this is a fairly new field. Uh, property tax incentives have generally not been allowed. There's a municipal act in Ontario, tax bonusing has not been allowed. But more recently, under the Planning Act, uh, municipalities can introduce what we call TEEs, Tax Increment Equivalent Grants. And under a TEE, the municipalities provide a grant to a new business uh, to cover a portion of the property tax increase when they make a new investment. So you're looking at a company to come and invest or an existing company that's going to expand. When they do that, when they increase the investment, the property value goes up. And because we have a system in Ontario of market value assessment, when the property value goes up, the assessed value goes up, and your property taxes go up. So as a way to attract businesses, municipalities can say, okay, when you, when you bought this property on day one, these were the property taxes. You invested, and there's been an increment in the property taxes as a result. We will not charge you for that full increment. We will give, you will pay the tax, but we will give you a grant to recover the increment based on your investment. 
And they do that in Windsor under the here in Windsor under the economic revitalization community improvement plan. And it's done in a lot of other cities in Ontario as well. Well, do property tax incentives work? And here, frankly, we have to rely on the US literature because they've been around for so long there. And we see a number of, of results from the studies done there. And one is that property taxes matter more within a region than they do between regions. So if you're a business and you're looking to locate in the US or Canada, uh, there are a lot of things that are more important to you than the property tax. You want access to skilled labor. You want access to transportation. Uh, there are a number of things you look at, and, and you look at other taxes, frankly, before you look at the property tax, because it isn't the major expense that you're going to incur. But when you decide that you're coming into a particular region, well, then your access to skilled labor is pretty similar. Your access to transportation may be similar. The one thing that may be a bit different is the property tax. So within a region, property taxes matter, and therefore tax incentives will have some but between regions, between countries, they're not going to make much of a difference. If you're the first kid on the block to introduce a property tax incentive, you might do okay. But if your neighbors all start to introduce property tax incentives, then it's, it's not going to make a difference. You're not going to have much impact. Size matters. So if the, the tax differential between your community and other communities is large, that will have an impact. But frankly, if it's just a little bit of money, uh, it's going to have less of an impact. Some businesses are more sensitive to tax incentives than others. If you are you know, a big manufacturer and, and you have a lot of capital and land, uh, then the property tax could be a significant amount of your, of your bill, uh, and then it may matter. Um, if you're mobile, it's going to matter. If you can go from community to community, pick up and leave, uh, then the tax incentive may cause you to do that. Uh, but some businesses want to be in certain locations. You know, if you've got a fashion store and you want to be in the trendy fashion district, then, then you're going to pay the higher tax. If you're uh, a bank tower and you want to be near the other bank towers, again, uh, you're going to pay the higher taxes. So the, the, the extent to which these tax incentives work depends on the kind of business we're talking about. And we shouldn't forget that services matter. When a business comes to, community, to a community, they want good services. They want the garbage to be picked up. They want police protection, fire protection. If the services are good, that's going to matter. So if you lower your taxes, and that means you're lowering your services, you may not attract businesses uh, very easily. So uh, the arguments for tax incentives is that the benefits to the community outweigh the costs. They're bringing in businesses that bring in more local revenues than they consume in services. That's an assumption that that's going to happen. New investment brings other benefits to a community, what we call agglomeration economies. So when a lot of firms locate together, they can specialize, they have a bigger market, um, they have access to other services, and, and, and it starts to build. One of the key things that it showed is the tax incentives show that uh, communities are pro-business. So if everybody's doing it, you sort of don't want to be the one community that isn't doing it uh, because it looks like you're anti-business. Uh, where we have brownfields that we need to remediate, often, often those lands will not get developed in this unless there is some kind of tax incentive. Last slide. What are the arguments against property tax incentives? Well, one of the key arguments is that they're wasting our firms that would have located there anyway. I actually had a call from the Toronto Star yesterday asking me this question. How do you know? How do you know businesses would have come anyway if you didn't have a property tax? It's sometimes hard to answer that because businesses will always say, oh yeah, I need lower property taxes. Of course they're going to say that. Uh, you know, there's a study in the literature of, of Boeing who wanted to move the headquarters, not the whole manufacturing part, but the headquarters in 2001. And they were looking at uh, Dallas, Denver, and Chicago. And, and two of those three really pushed incentives. And, and they ended up going to Chicago because they had a lot of incentives. Or was it the incentives? Or to the people in the head office when they looked at Chicago and they're from Dallas or Denver? You know, hard to answer those questions. When we get into property tax incentives, it can lead to a situation where no major investments occur without incentives. You've got this race to the bottom. You're lowering your taxes. 
because that means you're lowering something else, probably your services. It's a zero sum game. If you're attracting businesses to one location, it's at the expense of business in another location. So from a regional perspective or an Ontario perspective, there may be no overall increase in business activity, you're just moving it from one place to the other. And lastly, lower taxes for some firms means either higher taxes for existing taxpayers, businesses already in your community, or you're reducing services, neither of which is great. So if if we're finding that our business property taxes are too high, uh, of which they are in many Ontario communities, they're higher than residential, maybe what we really need to do is lower business taxes overall, not to just benefit incoming companies, but also to keep companies here. And let's also remember that businesses need services and infrastructure. And so whatever the municipality is providing for them means they don't have to provide it. And sometimes a better way to attract businesses uh, is by providing services and infrastructure, not necessarily lowering property taxes. Thank you very much. And that was amazingly short. And uh, I, I love that as a as a as a bar to set. So not that we have to go shorter, but if we can keep to that, that was right exactly on time. Um, I will uh, now invite our second presenter, Jared Rodriguez, to come up. He is a partner with Calder Group uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and is the co-founder of the nonprofit advocacy organization West Michigan Policy Forum. Uh, I think he's going to speak about that uh, to him. Thank you. I'm a little taller, but not too much, so I'll, I'll move that up. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come before you and talk about a success story, a success story from Michigan on the west side. Uh, we are firm believers that Michigan is a state with many different hearts, and uh, the West Michigan region and Grand Rapids <coughs> is one of those. And I just want to quickly go through, I have about 44 slides, so I'll, I'll take you through kidding on the five. <laughs> but I, just to highlight a couple of things, I'd like to get into a little bit of demographics. I've got a lot of data up on the slides, and I'll go through them pretty quick. Um, but history, the turnaround, what really happened, and, and what are the results today? So uh, Grand Rapids uh, or West Michigan, can see the demographics of where we are. We have a diverse population. Our industry presence is furniture, healthcare, education, automotive, aerospace, heavily manufacturing, and has rooted, has been founded and rooted in manufacturing for quite some time. Uh, going back, uh, West Michigan was settled by fur traders and missionaries, uh, and later became in the 1900s the furniture capital of the world, or known as the furniture city. Um, we have about 50 furniture manufacturers that were in existence uh, quite some time ago. Uh, primarily, they located in uh, the region for the river, roads, railroads, access, uh, as well as the community and its natural assets as well. Uh, ultimately, West Michigan grew as the Midwest manufacturing at the center through the 1900s. And uh, as I mentioned before, hosts the second largest city in Michigan, Grand Rapids. We did face, however, a little downturn, as with many different uh, uh, cities or municipalities throughout Michigan in the 1970s, with closing manufacturing facilities and resident out migration. Uh, what we were seeing is a little change in the economy, and we did see some of those impacts. I'm reminded of a story about our hometown president, President Ford, uh, and was going to be traveling through the city of Grand Rapids after his uh, time in office, or during his time in office in the 70s. And they were really concerned because there was many different boarded up buildings. They're, they're clearly right in the crux of downturn within uh, the city. However, what we did see is an effort to change that. And that effort did begin in the 70s and transcended through the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s. And I'll show you some graphics of what the results are today. Uh, ultimately, the turnaround was uh, based on private, public private partnerships and tax incentives. Some of the incentives that, uh, that are available and folks do utilize are brownfield uh, 
incentives, uh, renaissance zones, property tax abatements, job creation credits, of course, city investments. There are multiple uh, uh, incentives that are used. However, much of the turnaround was a result of private community, private sector investment in the community. Uh, and their goal was to build community alignment and move the city forward. And what we did see is uh, a little bit of that uh, private public partnership begin with an organization called Grand Vision Grand Action. And that was a group of private investors still active today in the philanthropic community. It was leader driven with a, a vision for the region and a vision for the core city. They knew that it was going to take their, their rolling up sleeves and getting involved to change the city. What they did is uh, they brought in municipal leaders, private sector investors, as well as uh, business folks, and put together a nonprofit organization that would be leader driven in the community with the focus of truly changing the landscape of West Michigan and ultimately the Grand Rapids. We have seen a convention center, an arena, um, healthcare is still a major component to the region, uh, as well as an urban market and universities or education are, are, are still strong pivotal points um, of Grand Rapids. Ultimately, the me mentality is that economic su success drives philanthropic giving and or community success. And you'll, if, if you do look up Grand Rapids or West Michigan, you will see that we are per capita one of the most philanthropic communities in the country, um, or in the entire US. And economic development and promotion is a key component to what's been going on over the last 20 years. And their focus has been on core city reinvestment and pushing to reinvestment and ultimately from the private sector. The private sector decided that they weren't going to sit around and wait for government to try to change the landscape of the region or Grand Rapids as a city. And that they were going to take an active role and invest themselves personally. Started uh, by a small hotel in Grand Rapids, we had a little soap manufacturer uh, Amway, who wasn't far away. They had nowhere to bring in and house or put up some of their uh, folks from around the world. They decided that they were going to invest in a hotel in downtown Grand Rapids. Worst investment anyone could have ever made. However, it wasn't to earn money. It was to build community and certainly have a place for people to locate. That began to transcend some of the changes within Grand Rapids and West Michigan and the give back mentality. Ultimately, the goal to be successful is to continue with public-private partnerships, but also build organizational alignment. It's great to have the partnerships and the investment dollars, but if you don't have an alignment, those dollars aren't going to be spent in the wisest fashion. So what they did is they decided that let's organize the business community, the nonprofit sector, let's bring education in, government, and create a community atmosphere. Ultimately, uh, we did work with uh, the city of Grand Rapids on a master plan, um, as well as educational institutions on what their vision was for the future and how we should build out a city. What are the results? If I can, there we go. Uh, we've had Grand Valley State University, Michigan State University, my alma mater, we've had an urban market downtown, a robust community uh, and community engagement of the citizens through theaters and the art museum and our arena. And, and I mentioned the convention center as well. This all helps grow the tax base. Not only are we having industry crop back up, manufacturing has come back, albeit in much smaller capacity than what it was before. However, we do have tourism as a new, I guess, influx into building that tax base. We also have what we call boomerangers, those that have moved away and have come back, established residence again. They're living in condos. They're living in, in refurbished homes and neighborhoods. We've seen a transcend of a downturned city back to a vibrant location because of private investment and private dedication by the private sector. I cannot tell you enough, however, 
that while the private sector was intricately and still is involved in the turnaround and keeping revitalization going, the government sector has been very cooperative and has been working with the private sector as well. What are the results in the community? We've got a tremendous amount of community engagement uh, through a variety of different uh, uh, capacities and venues. Uh, I will point out that we are known, uh, Grand Rapids is known as the Beer City. So that's pretty important, uh, especially for tourism. Uh, we have many different festivals uh, that have occurred and continue to occur around the region. Um, we do have a, what they call Millennium Park, which is one of the largest urban parks in, in Michigan. Uh, and it has a lake, uh, many different walking trails. Again, based on the premise of community engagement, which was started by a philanthropic giving. Our challenge is moving forward. With any growing and uh, revitalized community, you do have challenge. Our challenge is our talent. Where are we going to find those individuals to fill the jobs that are coming in today and tomorrow? Which is really good for us that we do have universities present, uh, and a number of them present downtown or around the West Michigan area. Growth management is another challenge. So when you start out, in, in Grand Rapids really was a donut hole. And what's happened is the ring, of the donut hole is being filled in now. And the ring is just stepping out further and further and further, which growth management is such a critical component when you're talking about urban core municipalities. So those are some of the challenges that we have to continue to work through. But ultimately, Grand Rapids, West Michigan has been a success because of public-private partnerships, and ultimately because of private investment and the philanthropic giving based around community engagement and changing, making a place for all to coexist. That's it for me. Thank you, Jared. Um, and I know you probably have questions, and we'll take them all at the end. I'm not uh, going to intervene that because I'm kind of happy with the way this is moving along, so I don't want to stop. Um, I would like to uh, introduce our next speaker, Fred Morley, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Economist of the Greater Halifax Partnership. And he'll be talking about some of the successes uh, economically uh, and uh, associated with business, etc., in the Halifax community. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, and, and uh, it was very interesting for me to come here from Halifax because Windsor is kind of around the same size as Halifax, so so I, I, you know it has a, it has the same feel to me as Halifax. It's even got the water view, which is kind of cool. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about uh, the various components of economic development, and this is a very simplified version of of the things that communities have to think about when they think about economic development. And uh, two things are very important on this, on this chart. I think are very important. First thing is right at the top, the issue of attitude. And attitudes within communities are critical to success and progress. And Grand Rapids sounds like they, they've got their act together. It's a good idea. Uh, the other thing is, is skilled labor force. And we've heard a lot about that today as well. And these are, are, are critical things. Skilled labor force is something that communities have to think about. But there's lots of other stuff as well. And, uh, attractive business climate over on the left hand side there. That's that's code. Attractive business climate is code for for good tax and regulatory policies at, at the local level. So those are, are critical and, and incentives and, uh, and and so on are part of the structure in a lot of a lot of communities. So uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on uh, on the incentive side and some of the research that we've come across and done ourselves on. On business incentives uh, at the community level. So, uh, as we already heard, incentives are sometimes uh, uh, a trade-off. If you're first in, if you're the strongest, uh, you get the strongest incentives on the block. You generally win. Uh, it's just the way it works. I, I work on the front line of economic development. I see this every day. Uh, sometimes incentives are just required to play the game. That's that's just how it works to bring deals to your community. This is a, a, a map of the United States uh, by state, and you can, it basically shows the areas of, of, of the U.S. that have some form of incentives, uh, which is every area of the United States. And some are more aggressive than others. The aggressive states are, tend to be towards the south, uh, Texas, uh, 
is, is one of those. Uh, there are states that are not very aggressive at all on incentives. They don't have very good incentives. Uh, California is some of the West Coast uh, uh, states and so on. So uh, I mentioned uh, Texas being uh, pretty aggressive. Let's drill into that a little bit. Um, Louis Story, uh, uh, who's a reporter at the New York Times, uh, a little while ago did a uh, very significant feature piece on incentives at the, at the local level in the United States, uh, at the state level. And what she found was that among the 50 states, there were actually 1,874 different incentive programs uh, in, in the United States that were worth, on a, on a yearly basis, on any given year, about $80 billion. Uh, there were 5,000 companies uh, uh, between uh, 2007, uh, or since 2007, that received more than a million dollars in incentives. And there was one company that received over a uh, hundred million dollars in incentives. Any guesses? One company, GM. Uh, might sound familiar. Um, so Texas leads the pack. Texas accounts for almost a quarter of all the all those state, state incentives. Uh, $759 per capita. A little over half the state budget goes to business incentives in, uh, in, in Texas, according to Louise's research. So, so pretty hefty uh, levels of business incentives uh, in the United States, and this is what we're competing with, so it's important we know about it. It's, you know, we, you know 80, um, $80 billion, uh, you know, $20 billion just in, in Texas. These are, these are uh, difficult things. To, those are big numbers, big numbers, the process. It's sometimes easier if you see how, you know, how it shakes out sometimes. One of, the, one of the big relocations in the United States recently is, was Toyota, uh, Toyota's head office in, that moved uh, out, of, uh, out of California um, to, uh, to Texas. Uh, that was 5,000 jobs. That, that, that head office had been in, 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 uh, in the same town in, in California for about four years. Uh, and they bought up and moved to, uh, uh, to Texas incentives for part of that picture. So, so uh, you know, having a weak incentive structure uh, gives you the moral high ground, but it doesn't necessarily give you the jobs. That's my experience uh, uh, on the front line of this stuff. Incentives also appear at the local level, um, and you know, especially around downtown redevelopments. We've already heard a little bit about that. We did some work a little while back, looking at um, at trying to establish some best practice in in downtown uh, development, downtown incentives uh, in Canada. We didn't look at Windsor, but we looked at a number of cities in Canada, and I thought this would be instructive. And their incentives were in three categories, basically uh, planning and implementation, which is the sort of regulatory side, uh, what places are doing there. The actual cash incentives or tax incentives, uh, and also quality place initiatives, which in some respects are, are very much an incentive to, to uh, business development uh, in downtown areas and uh, uh, certainly residential attraction. Uh, as well, the interesting thing is that is that um, not too many places are actually doing a very good job at at, at the planning side. Uh, Quebec City seemed to have some some good things going on in terms of planning uh, and regulatory side. Uh, the city that stood out to us on the in terms of being best practices on the on the downtown incentive side was actually your your neighbor up the highway here uh, in, in Hamilton seemed to have some pretty pretty interesting uh, things on the go. And most cities, or a lot of cities that we looked at, have, have quality place initiatives uh, that, that drive, uh, provide some incentives in downtown areas. So, uh, so incentives can be at the state, provincial level, uh, local level. Uh, they're quite pervasive. Everyone, most everyone has some. Uh, the, uh, I wanted to, to, I guess, end this just with a snapshot uh, from some research uh, that came out earlier this year from KPMG. Some of you may be familiar with this, but, but all this looks at is um, uh, 
basically a 10 year uh, uh, cost structure for various costs, including taxation for a typical business. In this case, a service sector business. And as you can see, um, hopefully you can see, a lot of the costs to business location is around labor, uh, um, especially, especially in the service sector. So the quality and availability of, of labor at the local level, cost of that labor is, is quite critical in the service sector. It's very interesting that, that the tax is, uh, just put a number in here at the top, uh, the tax is a very small percentage of of the business uh, cost structure of any of any given business uh, in the service sector. Uh, the height of the graphs are, are basically um, the cost competitiveness of, of, of those four cities uh, compared to each other, and they're not all that different uh, in Canada. So one city is not that different from another for the most part. And that's the same thing for the manufacturing sector. Uh, you see a different structure. Uh, labor is less important. Um, Materials are more important in, in this particular uh, uh, sector, but taxes are still not that big a part of the puzzle in, in terms of overall business costs. So we hear a lot about them, they're just not a big part of the, the, the business puzzle. So if I were to leave you with one thing, and that would be uh, uh, just going back to that first thing I mentioned, uh, that overall, all the things you gotta think of when you're thinking of, uh, of uh, the competitiveness of, of your community, uh, the talent aspect is critical uh, in all that. Tax is important, yes. Uh, business climate is very important. Uh, but talent is the key. It doesn't matter what sector it is, manufacturing, the service sector. Uh, talent is the, uh, is, is, is the prize. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. And our final speaker is Benjamin Erlkar. I cannot pronounce your name. Erlkar. Erlkar. That's why, because I've got the, um, and I, I'm horrible at pronouncing names. It should have vetted me before doing this. Um, he is Vice President of Economic Development uh, for New Development Strategies at the Detroit Regional Chamber and leads the Chamber's efforts to refocus its strategic priorities on economic development, education, and regional collaboration. Um, so he'll be speaking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I really appreciate it. Can all hear? Okay. Can come on across the aisle. Uh, thanks very much to uh, the Windsor X uh, Regional Chamber of Math. Holly, uh, Marianne, and the crew for, for putting this together. A great effort and, and a really fascinating discussion. Thanks also to my colleagues for setting the bar uh, in terms of speed and, and brevity of presentation. I'm going to do the same thing and give you an overview of what's going on in Detroit. Just a, just a macro overview of how we got to where we are today in Detroit. What you need to keep your eye on as the city moves forward. And the theme here, as you see on the title page, is really one of unprecedented challenges. <coughs> challenges that really no other city in the United States, or no other city that I know in this space, but also opportunities to come out of that. And so I'm going to build that into the, the presentation as well. The real question about Detroit, if you take an overview of it, is how in the world did this city get to where it is today? If you go back to 1950, Detroit was the crown jewel of the industrialized world, a testament to the triumph of the Industrial Revolution, the unquestioned global capital of the automotive sector, with a population of over 1.8 million people. In July of last year, when Detroit as a city, the municipality, filed for bankruptcy, it was famous, of course, for another reason, as the poster child of just about almost every conceivable urban ill. Blight, crime, municipal dysfunction, educational failure, you name it. That was the image of Detroit around the world. And of course, the ultimate economic development metric, population, had declined by more than half to under 700,000 people. And that, that population continues to decline, although at a much slower rate than it had throughout uh, the last decade. So of course, 
the, the reality, uh, just going beyond those simple statistics, is a little bit more complex in Detroit. And that's true today, uh, as it was for, if you look at the reasons that Detroit slid into its municipal bankruptcy. Detroit is an economic engine, unquestioned economic engine. And that engine continues to drive some of the recovery that you see going on today, not only in the city, but around this region. And I speak by nationally when I'm talking about a region. There has been in the city of Detroit over $10 billion of direct investment since the Great Recession. And you see efforts to bring Detroit up to speed in terms of redevelopment strategies, not only within the city itself, but around the surrounding counties. And you are seeing the beginnings of a conversation about sectoral diversification as a matter of industrial policy. Uh, whether we're talking about IT or healthcare uh, or biosciences, uh, obviously, and that's a, that's a subject that I hope we get to discuss a little in the questions and answers. So it's really important to just take a look at history when we look at what's going on in Detroit. Obviously, Detroit, we did not get into this mess overnight, as the saying goes. Uh, and so you can see, if you look at that history, that the seeds of why Detroit uh, has fallen to where it has, but also some of the seeds about how it's bringing itself out of that problem. You know, in the height of Detroit's industrial success, there began to occur, particularly after World War II, a massive deindustrialization that took from the city over time, the city alone, not the region, the city, over 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Today in Detroit, there are approximately 23,000 manufacturing jobs. That decline of over 300,000 uh, from the end of World War II. Population, some of the demographic trends uh, in the city and in the region uh, began to occur because of the shrinking of that economic base. Uh, there were undeniable social and racial tensions that resulted from a great migration of uh, labor force from the south uh, that, that produced a conflict with the existing population in Michigan and that resulted with the economic base shrinking in what we know popularly as white flight the mass exodus of the population of the city to the surrounding suburbs. So of course as that began to happen, population began to leave the city, as did the economic base. That put a strain on the tax base, which began to shrink, it put a strain on the city services, and that process, that vicious cycle of deindustrialization, depopulation, and a greater strain on municipal services and the municipal fisc uh, began to decline or degrade city services at just the very time that they began to be needed most within the city, uh, which led to the current situation in 2013. And then, of course, uh, some call it the straw that, coat that uh, uh, I think broke the camel's back. It was more like a tsunami. The Great Recession hit Detroit in its vulnerable position particularly hard. So what you see in Detroit right now is a really good coalition of business, government, nonprofits who have really focused the city's agenda on three things in particular. And again, it centers around the municipality and its functionality, but really it's much more, uh, I think, broad based and broad vision than that. The short term, of course, is to put the city on a solid fiscal footing. Uh, and in doing so, to ensure that central city services are provided to the population and the workforce within the city. And I'll talk a little bit about that. It's essentially, this is really basic city planning here. We're talking about security services, city lighting, first responders, that type of thing. The medium term concern in the city uh, is to redefine the city's footprint. Uh, over at its height, and as it exists today, the city's footprint is over 142 square miles. That, in, in that footprint, you could fit the cities of, or the, the areas of Manhattan, Boston, and San Francisco comfortably. And it's estimated that the municipal area the size of Boston is basically 
abandoned within, within Detroit. So you have to redefine the city's footprint. That's an essential function. The long-term goal, of course, and the basis of any population restoration uh, in any municipality, in any region, is of course the quality of the education, as well as quality of jobs and quality of life. Uh, and that is a, a longer term process that people recognize. Uh, it is not just a problem that is isolated to the city of Detroit. It is a regional and a statewide issue, uh, but it is one that folks are focusing on. So if it's funny to try and describe the history of Detroit in a single slide, it's even funnier to try and describe a municipal bankruptcy in a, in a single slide. But there are a couple of things that you should be keeping your eyes on. The first, obviously, is this bankruptcy, this municipal issue. It's a city issue, not a business issue. The municipal debt is $18 billion of unserviceable obligations. And there are two goals in restructuring that debt. The first goal is to minimize the pain, the cuts in pensions that public city employee retirees will face and that current public city employees will face as well. And that is a very complex structure. We could spend a day talking about the various classes of employees, whether they're current or retired, but that's a key goal. The second goal is to preserve from liquidation the city's core cultural asset, which is a collection of paintings, the collection of art that exists in the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's been a very controversial subject. That, that, two, that those two goals should be coupled together as a, as a combined uh, sort of strategic goal of the bankruptcy. But of course, the, the other goal, the third goal, is to lead the city after its bankruptcy with a sustainable fiscal base that it can operate and, and finance itself and provide quality of job, quality of life, and an educational system for its residents as well. And that's taking place in the form of a grand bargain, as it's called, we've read about it, uh, it is $816 million coming together from a coalition of the state government, the Detroit Institute of Arts, various philanthropies, and others uh, to finance the ongoing municipal pension system and to minimize the cuts that pensioners are going to face. And the question about that grand bargain, is everybody going to agree with it? And particularly the unions who represent those, those pensioners. Because if they don't, if they can't come to this voluntary adjustment, this voluntary resolution, then the bankruptcy court will in fact step in and impose its own solution. Uh, and while the judges and the mediators in the process have been very humane and very well reasoned and very wise in their deliberations so far, they're under no such obligation to do so when it comes to, to a bankruptcy, which can be pretty cold uh, and calculated. So very quickly, the, the policy priorities that we talked about. Uh, security and first response are key to attracting a, a population and ensuring the safety of residents. Same with lighting and transportation. And then as a longer term goal, regional transportation, which of course, uh, everybody recognizes that mobility uh, and transphysical mobility provides for social and economic mobility as well. In terms of remaking the city, there is a plan. Uh, it is about the thickness of a telephone book, or one of the old-fashioned telephone books. It's called Detroit Future City, uh, about redefining the neighborhoods of Detroit and the, the sectoral embassies uh, that it should focus on. And then education as well. We could hold a day-long seminar on each of these topics, but the idea is to recognize what school systems, not a school system, but a system of schools, will best serve the population as it exists in Detroit today, and the population that it looks to attract tomorrow as well. Some of the themes uh, that emerge from this that I hope you get a chance to discuss in your questions, what are we talking about in terms of industrial policy here? The auto uh, policy discussion in the earlier session resonated very deeply with me. We talk about this every day at the Detroit Regional Chamber and in Michigan. The state has released an auto strategy uh, as most people in the sector can recall the first of its kind. But that's a, that's a lesson to talk about. Legacy costs. What do we do about public pensions? Should municipalities even be in the business of managing pensions uh, in terms of defined benefit uh, plans? Or should they just shift to defined contribution 
policies as much as the business sector has. Planning comes up very, very well. It's, inc it's incredibly important for planning decisions as the city gets out of bankruptcy to do it right. This is the, this is, I think, as most people realize, one of the last best chances for Detroit to, to restructure and, and reconstruct uh, itself. And then there's just a question of political accountability and the ways in which business, political uh, classes, policymakers, and nonprofits are all beginning to demand more from each other than they have previously as well. Uh, the focus in Detroit right now is on governance, on public governance, uh, but that is a trend that also warrants deep examination. And I look forward to the discussion. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ben. Um, I, I know I have a bunch of questions in my head, and I'm not going to take any prerogative unless you don't have any questions, which I don't think is the case here. So what I would like to do is invite you to raise your hand if you have questions uh, to start the discussion, and uh, the microphone will find you. So, uh, if I heard the question correctly, uh, no one used the, the mic. Did, did I understand the question to be how does Michigan's status as a right to work state, how did that affect the 300,000 jobs? So, I, I think that the quick answer to that is no, it didn't. Those 300,000 jobs essentially left, uh, left Detroit over a period of about five and a half decades. Um, the right to work policy. Uh, and the law in Michigan, very controversial. It only came into effect a couple of years ago. Um, and and I, I would say, in, what is it, uh, end of 12? In December 2012. 2012. Yeah. And um, again, very, very controversial. Uh, it is unclear at this point what effect right to work has had on unionization and on job creation, on job. Uh, disappearance. Um, you know, it's interesting to know, I, I will say as well, that, you know, there's a big cleavage in the in the policy debate between union labor and non-union labor and union and management. In Michigan, private sector union employees constitute 12% of the economy. 88% of Michigan's private sector workforce does not belong to a union. If you add public sector employees into that percentage, Michigan's workforce, 18% is unionized. So that's a that's a that's a distinct minority, but it's an important minority in terms of numbers. Jared, I, I, I welcome. This is a subject you spent eons on. I'd love your comments on it as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I think it's too early to tell what the impact is. We have had a number of. of uh, Industries look at our state and relocate or expand since December of 2012. Uh, ultimately, what it has done is allowed our state to get beyond page two of any site selectors. Uh, when it comes to looking for a place to either relocate, establish a headquarters, or create a new industry or business, it's gotten us past that page two now of site selectors, which is so vitally important to any growth mechanism within the state. More questions for the panelists? We have probably another five minutes. Question for Jared. Um, very interesting presentation on Grand Rapids, and I loved the idea of the private sector setting up to help with the revitalization and public partnerships, which I believe is a more sustainable model. But my question is, um, I guess, twofold. I'm more interested in knowing, first of all, what motivated the private sector to step up, other than we want to have a place to live and grow our children, have jobs. And, and maybe I, I want to know the flip side of that coin was, what were you hearing as the hesitations of not? Because, you know, the reality is, I think that's what we need to do in the 
and serve its own. Um, but what is it going to take for our community leaders, the private sector, to step up? What is it that made a difference in your community, other than just saying, you need to do this because it's the right thing to do. It's because it's where you live and breathe. Because for some reason, um, I don't know if that's enough. A lot of it was image and the private sector saying if we are going to grow industry or grow as a state, we can't have this as an image. We've got to step up and do something. We cannot wait. Do it now. Um, ultimately, there's a regional mindset that economic success brings about personal freedom, which brings about community investment. And it became a mindset that was that was changed that we are not going to let the region, or in this case, the core city of Grand Rapids, fail. We want to change things. And ultimately, um, you know, I always ask the question, what's your greatest natural resource? Uh, the private sector, and uh, at least in West Michigan, will tell you that people are the greatest natural resource that we all have in common and that we should be able to tap into and utilize. So the transition of Grand Rapids Yes, was brought about by private sector investment and individual philanthropic efforts, foundations, and other organizations. But ultimately, it is working with government to develop that plan. Other questions? Actually, Jared, while you're there, okay. I have, um, since you're still there, um, I was interested in all of you spoke about incentives, and uh, it's nice to talk about that broadly and, and talk about them being complex. But if I wonder if I could put you on the spot a bit. If you're in the position, say, that we are here and we are, we're looking to have a plan going forward uh, after the next election, um, what would you put at the top of your list as being the most important thing to do right now? To attract business and to, to grow the economy in, in the area, just just number one to well, start. Well, clearly, um, taxes are a big big component to any revitalization, uh, but so is community and sense of place, and so does um, your assets that you bring about as a community. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to grow tax base to be able to provide either additional quality service, um, revamp what you currently have or look to the future of what you can supply to the residents in the future, and education is also in there. Um, ultimately, I think Grand Rapids and West Michigan is continuing to go through this transition, um, but ultimately there were a number, and there currently are a number of tax incentives. They are controversial in many cases because the adage that you're picking winners and losers in the private sector and industry is a conversation that continuously comes up. But ultimately, one of the things that really helped in West Michigan and Grand Rapids is Brownfield credits. And, and one of the best administered programs that we've seen and has allowed a lot of transition of some of those neighborhoods, buildings, things that weren't functional or were essentially functionally obsolete have turned around and become condos, become mixed space, new space. We've turned a lot of the old manufacturing facilities that were vacant in the 70s now around to different purposes. We've repurposed a lot of those buildings. The commitment, however, is to maintaining the historical uh, nature of those buildings and houses and things within Grand Rapids uh, or West Michigan. Uh, and they wanted to do that on purpose. Uh, so we've seen a good transition of all a lot of the old factories, other types of um, storefronts, if you will, and it, it is it has led to uh, quite quite the energy, I guess, in the city. Great. Um, can I invite other panelists to comment on the same question? Very quickly, uh, Governor Snyder of Michigan has made a very conscious decision, summed up in, in the phrase he likes to use, which is to say, the best business attraction tool is a healthy investment environment. So he has uh, without stating it so much, he has, as a policy matter, he emphasized financial incentives. What was the number for Texas? Something like $19 billion. Uh, it's at a state level in terms of pure uh, credits and tax incentives. At the state level in Michigan, that number is $150 million. Now, the, the issue, uh, so you see, and now, and 
Michigan, so it's probably too early to tell uh, how that policy is going to work, but Michigan has done very, very well in terms of attracting direct investment. Coming out of the recession, how much is the, that is attributable to tax policy as opposed to, say, value rise for investment uh, remains to be seen. The, the issue that I took from Dr. Stock's really, really illuminating presentation was that most of the other incentives that are available in Michigan reside at the township and at the individual municipality level in terms of property tax abatements. And so and there are many, many of those jurisdictions in Michigan. And so what you see then are those municipalities effectively competing with each other to get property tax abatements without generating the kind of macroeconomic effect in terms of attracting investment that, that you might like to see. That's, a, that's an issue that people are really quite concerned about. Yeah, maybe uh, I could, uh, in, in Nova Scotia, a number of years ago, we developed a very modest uh, business incentive that was, uh, we, we call it a payroll rebate. It's basically a very simple tool that that uh, provides 6 or 8 percent of uh, uh, payroll costs back to the employer uh, who is paying, uh, obviously, a, a, on incremental jobs, uh, those employees are paying tax uh, and the government gets a benefit of that equal to you know, 15 to 20 percent of, uh, of, of payroll. So it's a net gain for the, for the province, but we, we use this uh, tax in Nova Scotia, or this uh, incentive in Nova Scotia really just to get in the game, you know, to be, uh, you know, to be uh, not discounted uh, immediately when uh, companies are looking for, uh, for a new location because we have nothing, we have nothing to offer. We, we actually have no municipal incentives we, we offer in, 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 Nova, in, in Nova Scotia anywhere. So this just is a small, simple incentive was just put in place just to get us at the table in the game. And I do believe that's, that's important. <laughs> well, I guess I started it, so now I get to finish it. Um, so I, as, as Rila uh, was just talking about property tax incentives at the local level, not getting into the whole issue of state tax incentives. And what I said at the beginning is, if you provide a property tax incentive and, and business comes, would, would they have come there anyway? And that's what we don't know the answer to. But I did mention brownfields, and, and that's come up a few times. Because with brownfields, the developers really cannot turn those around. Because of the remediation costs associated with the brownfield, they wouldn't come anyway. And so the incentives that we have in Ontario that are used for brownfield redevelopment, I think are really a good idea and really worthwhile. And I noticed on Fred's chart, he had Hamilton as a best practice. And Hamilton actually is one of the leaders in brownfield tax incentives to, to remediate. I'm sure this conversation will continue later on. 